that so kind of speech. it is 703 and I will ask everyone oh I'll call the meeting to order and ask everyone to stand and pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you I will look for an approval of the agenda. I'll make that. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion, additions, changes? Seeing none, all of those in favor? That looks unanimous. Um, so public input. I don't think we have any. None I'm aware of. No public input. So approval of the minutes from 918. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Second. I'll second. I'll second. We'll let Rebecca toss for who got that. Whoever, Rebecca. Uh, any changes? No changes. Uh, all those in favor? I abstained opposed? because I was, I was just going to say just opposed? abstained. Abstained? But I, yes, I was absent. One, one abstained. <laughs> um, and then we are now at the sports update. Kim, do you want to present that or do you want me to put that up on the screen while you're talking? Do you mind putting it up? I do not mind at all. I will Thank do you. that. I'll get that going. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, I shared with everybody um, the update for tonight. Um, kind of short, but um, with fall in full swing, um, some sports actually coming to an end in a couple weeks. Um, we have 180 student athletes who are participating in a fall sport. Um, and with 370 students as the current enrollment as of today when I looked, um, it's about 49% of our student body participating. That's awesome. Um, that's probably our biggest uh, since I've been here. Um, uh, you'll see that <clears throat> um, rock climbing is at 22, and that's a sport that kind of goes through fall into winter, so those numbers will carry over to our winter season as well. Um, Bass fishing, we had four students register, but unfortunately we didn't get that kicked off this year. Um, we had a little bit of a hiccup with getting a coach. Um, you have to have a coach, you have to have a captain, you have to have a boat. Um, so it's just a lot, but we now have somebody on board and willing to jump into that next year. Um, and with bass fishing, there's really only two tournaments, and it's a very short season. It's already over. Um, so. Um, you can see the numbers of students participating in everything. Um, this coming weekend is homecoming. This whole week has been our kind of spirit week and, and different things going on during the school day. Uh, Saturday, we have three games at Mill River. Uh, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 2 o'clock. Girls varsity soccer, boys varsity soccer, varsity football. Cheerleaders will be there for the football game, which is our 7 through 12 um, fall cheerleaders. Um, the chamber singers will be performing the national anthem for the football game. And there is going to be different student-run activities going on throughout the day. Um, there will be a bouncy house there. There's going to be different <laughs> food, a concession stand, and some face painting, and, and things like that that clubs are going to be out there for. Hmm. Um, we just had two of our golfers qualify to attend states uh, next week. So Maddie Serafin is a Mount River student, he is a junior, and Andrew Bailey, who is a West Rowan student but is golfing um, with us this year. So they will be representing us next week, so we're really excited about that. Um, I threw in here, um, just, just skip over Arbiter for a minute, uh, schedule so you can see um, our website and then the document that lists um, all of our sports, games, um, practices, um, that's also <coughs> on the website for parents to see. Um, 
I have had initial conversations with Arbiter Sports. Um, Arbiter is the platform we use for officials, um, our assigners of fish, um, assign officials through there, and um, now there is uh, Arbiter Pay, which I believe this is the second year that the VPA has been a sponsor or a partner with them. Um, and so about 80% of our uh, Vermont high school schools are paying their officials through Arbiter Pay. Um, so that means once a game is complete, um, myself, I would go in and I would put the score, I would make sure that the two officials that are listed are the two that were at the game, I would submit the score, um, and then I would pay them right after the game ended. Um, and then that would, you know, take away from waiting a month to a month and a half, because um, we right now do it monthly, and then have to wait for a board meeting for those checks to go out. So Arbiter takes care of all that, um, and we get to decide how much money we put into the account and that money can come out at any time. Um, so I just had the in initial meeting with Arbiter. I got some um, finances sent to us of what it would cost. So next step is to meet with um, Stan and hopefully put this in for winter season. Um, looking ahead, we have uh, varsity softball position still open as well as track and field. Um, I have reopened softball a couple times because we have not had a lot of applicants apply. That will be shut down in at the end of October and we will start uh, interviewing for that. And I have unfortunately not gotten any varsity track and field applicants, but we will keep that open as that's a spring sport as well as softball. Um, facility projects. So the bleachers were removed in the middle school gym, the new bleachers were installed, the middle school gym was painted, and we moved the gym pads that are on each end of the gyms in the main gym to the middle school gym, because um, those gym pads needed to be replaced. So we have new wall pads that will be going up in the main gym. Um, awesome Graphics is the vendor we're working with on that. Um, registration for winter will open October 14th. <laughs> uh, so that's really all I have for um, you know middle school and high school update for you for sports and then just a quick update on elementary. We have 83 students in the district competing or, or playing soccer for three to six. Wow. Uh, we will be offering three and four boys and girls basketball, basketball, five and six boys basketball, and three through six cheerleading this winter and they will start in January for that. And games are held at Mill River in the middle school gym. Um, and then our AD for elementary is meeting other elementary ADs in November to finalize those game schedules and their registration will open in early November. Are there any questions? I, I would just like to make a statement, Kim, if I could, this is Len Doucette. Um, the arbiter pay thing is, makes the athletic director's life tremendously easier. Having done it for a year, um, which made me even crazier than I am now, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how you keep all, <laughs> no pun intended, the balls up in the air in order to do this. And I think anything that we can do as a board to make it so you don't have to march out, well, you don't even march out because you have to submit it and it takes weeks and months in order before they get paid for a job that they did. And I, and I do make mistakes and sometimes I don't fill out the form correctly or I forget to have them sign it or we like, forget to write down as we collect through the month yeah. games they've done, and I get emails that, oh, you didn't pay me for this game on this date, and then I have to go back. And um, I was, I to be completely honest, I was very skeptical of this at first, and, you know, and, <laughs> and now that I've talked to a lot of other ADs, especially in our SBL league, which is the Southern Vermont League, yeah. um, we are, there's about five schools that are not part of Arbiter, and we would be one of them. Yeah. Um, and every every time we have officials come, they're like, "Oh, you're an arbiter, right?" And I say, "No, nope. mm -hmm. 
you'll get your check in about a month. And, and thank, <laughs> thankfully, they don't walk away. I mean, it, it's no. just so much easier when it's it's done that way, and and yeah. it, there's too many other things that can go wrong with the process, and and this would streamline it, and you know, arbiter schedules the officials anyways, and I mean, I right. again, you people. Take care of the w Oh, um, like, so the biggest oh, yeah. thing is, like, sometimes we have the same officials, but yeah. then they move and don't tell me. So yeah. then we write a check that goes to the wrong address, and yeah. then we have to yeah. wait for that check to come back to, re, you know, resend out the new check with yeah. the new address. Yeah. So they take that on. 21st century. They have Let's to update all of that. I, I, I guess my point is I would support it wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. and, and I would ask the board to <coughs> be, if you haven't done that job, <laughs> You have no idea balancing the schedule and officials and all of that stuff and anything that that can make an athletic director's job any easier we should do I just want to say Kim I think it's really impressive the the various opportunities you're offering um, students to be active and have healthy things to do after school it's i think it's pretty impressive all the choices um, that are available for a school of this size it's pretty pretty commendable so great yeah. job with that mm -hmm. Thanks. i have to give a shout out to tirsa um right i always uh is that no Teresa. um sarah sarah, sarah. Yes. after school sarah. program yep yeah yes thank you um she has been working with us um, and supporting the students after school who are waiting for practices. Um, she provides them with a snack. They hang out in the cafeteria and, and do work, and their coaches come and get them. So, I mean, you can see the numbers that we have, and a lot of these practices don't start till 3.30 or 4. So at some point, we could have, you know, 100 kids sitting in the cafeteria waiting. So um, very appreciative of her and the two uh, support people that are there helping um, supervise those students so they can stay after school because we know transportation is a huge issue with getting kids to a school after school has ended. And, and I think to add to that, awesome <laughs> that we're offering so many things. Awesome that Teresa can partner and support to make that accessible for more students. Uh, we heard from the board several years ago about elementary sports, and I think it's worth noting that we have tried to work hard to expand those offerings and have more yep. students engage there. And I think to, to Kim and the department's credit, we're seeing, we're seeing progress. We're seeing that pay off. Uh, you know, we talk about having programs we can be really proud of, and sometimes we talk about lagging and in leading indicators. Well, we're seeing some leading indicators in those elementary numbers. Mm -hmm. That's gonna, down the road, three, four, five years, make our, make our program at the middle high stronger. That's gonna be lagging, though, but I think uh, Kim is doing the work now. We're seeing the leading indicators, so we have some hope that that's gonna pay dividends in the future. Well, just think about the fact that we haven't had a boys' soccer, yeah. varsity soccer team yeah. in what, two or three years, Kim? Yeah. Um, so this would have been year five okay. that we wouldn't have one. So we, four years we partnered with MSJ, and so this is our first year back. Yep. Which, first, which is, <laughs> when you look at the elementary school numbers, mm -hmm. and that grows, and when they get here, mm -hmm. th that just provides more opportunities. So I, you know, the, the difference in the elementary school, I think, is, is critical. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, again, I know it's a lot of work, but, um, and I know you have a lot of folks helping you, which is good, um, but, you know, I appreciate your leadership um, in getting this stuff in place, because I know how hard it is. Yeah, Kim, thanks for doing everything you do for the kids and um, encourage folks to go out to homecoming on Saturday. <laughs> you can make it. Yeah. Yeah. It should be a really fun day. There's a lot of work being put in for a lot of just things for the fans to do while they're there. So we're hoping everybody comes on out. So who's going to do the bouncy house? Do I see if volunteers? They let me in, I'll do it. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Does, uh, does Sarah? 
Go ahead. Sorry, Kim. Sarah maybe had her hand up if she wanted to uh, ask something or say something. Or maybe that's lingering from a vote. From a vote, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I just saw it. I think that was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Kim? I guess not. Thank you for your presentation, and again, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Yep. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. <clears throat> um, I guess that brings us to board education. Um, the fun part. <laughs> <That's a joke. laughs> uh, it's appropriate for the time of year. Yeah, it totally is. Uh, and we had on our schedule, we had time to either look at our board goals or to do an education piece. We talked about doing an education piece and finance seemed to be very appropriate given the time of year. I sent two VSBA resources along and what I'm going to work through today and I'm going to try and go fairly quickly is a, is a summary of those resources basically. Uh, and then if we want to stop and talk and ask questions and all that fun stuff, let's do that because I think understanding this stuff matters in being able to communicate uh, with the community about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how it works. And I think with education finance, there are a lot of confusing pieces of it because it's so darn complicated. Uh, so uh, education finance in Vermont. Uh, I'm going to talk about the board's role and the administration's piece and the public's piece, how they tie into the board's role first. So three things that the board is really going to be trying to work on in reference to the budget. Accountability is a big piece. Uh, accountability to our taxpayers, ensuring that what we're doing is efficient and ensuring that what we're doing is ethical. We'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how we do that in a, in a bit. Budgeting is a big piece too. Ensuring that there are adequate resources to accomplish our goals. We set goals, but we need to have the resources to be able to do the work to actually meet those goals. And then monitoring. <laughs> so responsible management, internal controls, reviews, and audits. I'm going to focus on budgeting. And we're going to touch on accountability and we're going to touch on monitoring as we focus on budgeting. So if you think about budgeting as a cycle with two parts, the first cycle is going to start at the top with the board. So the board sets goals. Uh, the board is looking across our communities and looking across our schools and thinking about what do we want. Uh, you can be thinking about what do you want for the community as far as taxes go. You can be thinking about what programs do we want to offer and what outcomes we want from those programs. So those are all goals that we're trying to balance. Uh, after setting those goals, it's the administration's job to present a draft budget. Last night, we started going down the path of a draft budget. We brought the Finance Committee a rollover budget. And we identified places in that rollover budget that are really question marks that we need to dive deeper in and think about. And we also requested to the Finance Committee that they give us direction in where do you want us to go? Where is that balance of taxes and programs and outcomes? Uh, what's the target that you want us to try and hit with a draft budget. So that really leads us into that second piece of the board's work, which is collaborating with administration towards a final budget and then adopting a final budget. So we had that initial budget meeting with the Finance Committee last night with a very, very big draft. We have some specifics on targets that we're going to go and we're going to do a little more work and we're going to bring back to the Finance Committee. And that really becomes a collaboration where we, where we say, here's what you wanted to see. Here's our best effort at getting there. And then we can have some negotiations around uh, how well that is working and if it looks appropriate. So making the tweaks, if that makes sense. Uh, board adopts a final budget. That's typically going to be end of December or early January. And that goes to voters. And voters weigh in at the ballot box on the budget. Uh, questions on that piece? I think that's the easier, simpler thing. 
Uh, there's another budgeting cycle that gets into some of those other pieces. Once we have a budget, up at the top, administration's job is now to provide financial statements. You get payroll, you get warrants. We look at those every meeting. You get quarterly reports in our finance committees. Stan gave a brief quarterly report last night in the finance committee. We're not very far into the year, so there's not much there. But as we go through the year, we will continue to give finance committee updates uh, there. So the board is gonna review those publicly. Uh, you do the payroll and the warrants publicly at our full board meetings. We'll do some tonight. And those quarterly reports are reviewed publicly at our <coughs> finance committee meetings. Uh, voters see the work and understand the challenges because that is done publicly. We have these budget discussions in the open uh, and we try to do that in a way that's transparent. So when voters go to vo uh, vote, they have a sense of why we're doing what we're doing because we're transpiring all this work in public. Uh, based on the community watching what we're doing, seeing the work that we do throughout the year, the board is getting a sense of how the community feels about that work. We're gonna do some budget forums. That's a way that the board is gonna get a sense of how the community feels about how the work is going and the board can represent the community's values in the next budget cycle. So we have a budget season cycle that we're really in, in right now, and then we have a second half of the year cycle. How are things going? Let's get feedback from the community. Let's prepare us for the next budgeting cycle. Um, William likes to point out that uh, just as soon as we're done doing budget, we're back doing budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is pretty much a year-round process, um, believe it or not. Questions about that? Okay, now we get into the really fun stuff. So education <laughs> finance, uh, that's your role. Those are the cycles, we're gonna do that work. Great. Uh, Act 60 in 1997 uh, was the Brigham decision and that's what looked at our state constitution and <coughs> that clause that gives everybody equal access to education was interpreted in a way that uh, folks were told we needed to change our system to actually follow that and give everybody that equal opportunity to education so that uh, towns with higher property values didn't just have more for their students that there was a more equitable distribution of those resources. Act 68 in 2003 was a, a tweak to that system. There was a challenge with some of the towns with higher property values where they wanted to fund more locally but they couldn't necessarily fund more locally. So Act 68 uh, put in place uh, an excess spending threshold which gave some towns the opportunity to go higher and take that penalty on themselves. So a, a minor update to the new system put in place by Act 60. Act 127 was what was enacted in 2022 but really came into place last budget season. We did a lot of conversation last year around equalized pupil numbers and those pupil weights. Those weights were designed to support students with higher needs through higher funding levels. Uh, we were a district last year that was somewhat advantaged. That means our pupil weights brought us more tax capacity uh, without our local taxpayers having to uh, create that tax capacity themselves. Uh, Act 127 had some interesting wrinkles to it, some unintended consequences. There were some last minute changes put in place that made last budget cycle the most unpredictable budget cycle we've really seen in, uh, that I've seen in you know, 13 years that I think any of us have seen in a long time. Questions about the basis and legislation? Okay. And if I may. Yep. I think it's important to understand and when you look at the equalized pupil yeah. that it, it, the, the state has decided that to educate this student mm -hmm. costs this amount. Yep. It doesn't come from us. Yep. 
as a board yeah. or as a community. The state says if you have an elementary student, it costs X. Yeah. High school and if you, students cost a little more. Yeah. And and students when you're looking at English is ESL yeah. and those kinds of things all impact that. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so now that we have a sense of where the system came from as far as legislation and court cases, the practical mathematical pieces of how do we actually get to a district tax rate. So boards across the state put forward budgets and those are approved by voters on town meeting day. The state is obligated to fund all those past budgets. So if a budget passes, the state is obligated to raise the taxes to fund those budgets. Now, each district is going to do a calculation of their per pupil spending. So that's going to be the, the total expenditure budget that we have, and we're going to divide it by the number of those equalized pupils. Now, that's not the actual number of no, students. No, it's not the actual number okay. of students. It's the equalized pupil number. Uh, now, the okay. state then, because if we stopped there, reasonably simple. Yeah. Not too terrible. Uh, but now we have this challenge where, well, all these, all these budgets that pass, we have to pay for. Uh, but what the happens if towns to can't? It. Yes, the state. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. What happens if towns can't afford that? Uh, so the state has calculations in place in order to meet the intent of this legislation. So those calculations make adjustments to make this possible. Uh, so the state's going to determine the level of funding required by all districts and set a yield number. Uh, and that yield number is going to matter in how we figure out our district tax rate. Where we are in relation to that yield number is going to set our tax rate higher or lower. So is the yield number, what is that? Great. I'm getting Great that. question. <laughs> Perfect. Go sit um, in the back of the room. <laughs> uh, I'll come back to this, okay. but just so you know, the Ed Fund is. Do I? Oh, I didn't do it. Because I've heard that one. and I've wondered what the heck that yeah. is. The Ed Fund that's going to pay for all of these budgets mm -hmm. comes from a couple of places. Homestead is the light blue, non homestead is the red, general fund is the green, sales tax is the yellow, lottery, and a couple of other various uh, tax type things in those small slivers. So the homestead tax rate is the one that we really think about and talk about a lot because that's what impacts our communities the most. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the yield. Okay. Yay. Knowing, knowing about that homestead tax rate and where it fits is going to matter when we talk through the yield. So the yield is a per pupil amount of spending that can be supported with a uniform uniform homestead tax rate of $1 on homestead value or 2% of household income. So if we set a tax rate across, across the whole entire state that was the same, $1 <coughs> per $100 of value of property, and we collected all that money, we can come up with a yield number that tells districts how much they can spend per pupil. So you'll notice town A, because of property values, and maybe the size of the town can only raise a certain amount of money. Town B might be, have higher property values, might have more properties. They can raise more funds. Uh, town C is in the middle. So because of Act 60 and the following legislation that uh, added on to that uh, education finance formula, we redistribute those taxes across the state so that all students can have uh, equitable funding and access to education. So town A actually gets more funding from the state than they raise locally. Town B gets funding from the state, but some of the excess funding that town B raises goes to support other towns that can't raise as much. Okay. Hmm. How, how are we doing? Okay. That's we're out of their. We're that's a out of quarter. Their, that's out of their homestead. <laughs> right. Sliver. You got a yeah. question. A quarter of the way. And, and Josh has a question. <laughs> Josh. So, uh, yeah, I did have a statement of, um, and the other part of that too is is that even that town that is above the per pupil spending level, there there really is no towns that can afford 
paying for their schools just because we saw that pie graph. Yeah. Even though they might have more property value, yeah. they still can't fund their schools just on those taxes. Good point. So Sales tax. State funding still has to come into every single district. Yeah. No matter how their property tax. Yeah. Exactly. From, the homestead's what, 27% or something? Yeah, and it fluctuates from year to year, but tends to be around that. Yeah, so that's a great point, Josh, that we are still not funding our schools just through property taxes. That's a quarter of what's coming out of the Ed Fund, or a quarter of how the Ed Fund is funded. Uh, great. So the yield is this idea that we can spend this much per student across the whole entire state. We can raise that funding. Okay. Local budgets might be in different places from that yield number. So if that yield number, for example, is $12,000 per student, town A might pass a budget that is $11,900 per student. They're below the yield number. Town B might be 13,000, town C might be 14,000. So locally we can set different budgets and based on where those budgets are in reference to the yield, that's how we calculate our district tax rate. So if we are above the yield, so we pass a budget that is higher than that yield number that the state is saying this is a reasonable amount that we can fund everywhere for everybody. Uh, if we pass a budget that is higher than that yield number, our district tax rate has to go up to make up for that difference. Um, Are you with me still? No. No. Okay. So in the example of C, and Brian can correct me if I'm yep. wrong, the state has said we can afford to spend this. Red line. Red line. You passed and a budget. You passed that a is budget that is 10% over that. You need to raise funds. Your district tax rate is going to go up. And what? that would be just the homestead tax. Yes. No, no, yes. no, no, no. Yes. Okay. But you don't find out the yield until later. Yes. We get a prediction on the yield in December. They set the yield in the spring. Kim? Uh, I think you answered it, but I'm just going to make sure. Yeah. So, like, Town B over there with excess, yep. even though, like, let's say their purple line mm -hmm. is above, mm -hmm. but, like, their excess is no longer theirs because of... Yeah. So, so it like, goes back. So, so they still ha would have to raise. Okay. Be because that excess in town B mm -hmm. is needed elsewhere. Right. So they don't just get to go, oh, our taxes stay lower. Great, right. great, 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 great. Len? Uh, okay, we're halfway there. The, the, the only <laughs> town so far that no, is they the only town that is winning so far is A. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question mm -hmm. though. Yeah. You have yeah. actual raised. Yep. What is that based on? Actual dollars raised, so that would be that $1 per $100 of property value in the town. On the homestead. So that's the actual okay. amount of money that you could raise with a rate of $1 per $100 of property value. And that's, but that's speculative because, um, I mean, our taxes are more than a dollar aren't they or not but, I don't but know. all Neither. things being equal this is what you could do so we have to start with all things being equal and look at what you could do so that's not based on the, the grand list or any of that that's just a arbitrary number that so the state sets the they're gonna look at the grand list to see what your property values are and then we can say what's a dollar per hundred a property value and then you can compare across every town their tax capacity but we got to use that. We, we can't look at the real tax rate. If we look at $1 and pretend the tax rate's a dollar everywhere, then we see what tax capacity is. Mm -hmm. Does that help? No, I think I'm going to need um, a tutorial on this. So I, I, we need to move on. But well, and just, I. I and, that, and that's how complicated it, it, it literally is. Yeah. It uh, seems to me, yeah. and. and Call your representatives. I feel like I'm in high school. <laughs> well, it just right? seems to me that a lot of this stuff yeah. comes yeah. after we've yes, done the budget. It does. So I'll keep going. I'll keep Wait, going. Brian, I got it. <laughs> yep, go ahead. Wait, Steve. I was right? <laughs> just, re just real quick. So when they in the first. Oh, we're losing your sound. Maybe that was on purpose. 
there's yeah, a now we can. Yeah. December 1st, when they set the yield, when they predict. Yeah. Okay. This is because they're trying to fund. Hi, Phoebe, I know. Uh, to a certain level. Yes. That's what that, that is. And yes. That, Level is based on, I'm guessing, the uh, budgets that passed last year? No, they do, they, they ask the field, what are your budgets looking like? So they try to figure out where districts are going and what they're doing. And I'm going to keep going, and this will make a little more sense as I keep going. No. That's a good question, no. Stephen. Okay, maybe they don't ask every district, they ask a couple. Oh, no, they ask them all. They ask them all. Um, Oh, okay. All right. Do we know how right, many? Move. You can move on. <laughs> how many states actually? Do, are we one of the only? States we are very it? rare in how we fund our schools. Okay. Cool. Yeah. We're the textbook example where if you read a textbook about Ed Finance, there's a chapter about Vermont because it's pretty different. Get out of here. So, um, as the yield changes, so whatever the state decides to set that yield at matters. Because as you're developing a budget and that <laughs> yield changes, all of a sudden you can have gaps where town A was fine, but the yield changed, so there's a gap, so town A is no longer fine. So that yield really makes a big difference. We can do everything we, we think is reasonable budgeting and then December 1st go, uh-oh. Oh. And, and that's only a prediction, right? Yes. I mean, that, that's... Keep going. Um, the December number okay, is I'm only sorry. a prediction. No, totally fine. Totally fine. Interrupt me. I, I love it. Uh, <laughs> generally, if the yield goes down, the tax rate goes up. The yield going down means this is you can spend less per student according to the state. Right. Right. So if right. the yield is going down, your yeah. tax rate's probably going up. If the yield is going up, the state's saying, oh, we're in good shape. You can spend more. If the yield goes up, our tax rate's probably going down. Okay, so yield... The word, yes. the definition of the word yield in this situation is how much money we think is we can collect. the state going to collect out of the Ed Fund from where? From uh, homestead. homestead taxes. Okay, and the well, homestead tax uh, you know, is actually changed think, every year. So I, how I, do they know? I think it's from I think it's just the Ed Fund in general. Oh, Here's okay. the revenue forecast for the Ed Fund. Let's divide it by number of students. That's our yield. Yeah. Because uh, I was going to ask with like so the general fund, which is like a pretty proportional amount. Yeah. It looks like as the homestead yeah. amount. Yeah. Is that? That's not set in stone. Could the legislature spend out of the Ed Fund more right. and not right. fund this okay. out of the, or sorry, general, the general fund. General, 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 fund. Yeah. Right. general fund is very large and right. some goes into the Ed Fund, mm -hmm. some goes to pay for hotel vouchers, some goes to pay for um, flood relief, you know, good things we can, we can talk about. Uh, and then some goes to pay for education. Legislature decides how much of that general fund goes into those buckets. So that could change. Right. And again, that's yeah. out of our hands. Yes, yes. that's out of I, our I, hands. And I'm sorry I'm going to keep harping on that. Yeah. Out of our that, hands. that yeah. stuff so, gets done and we sit here. So we, we, I, and I love it. You're anticipating all my slides. One second. <laughs> oh, one second. Okay. Here, one second. Because what Kim was just identifying is, well, we care about homestead tax a lot. We talk about homestead tax a lot, but if the if what goes into the if the general fund right. amount goes up, what we need to collect for homestead tax probably goes down. If there is a large surplus, uh -huh. now you see your state level surplus down here. Wow, the yield went up. Wow, town C is fine now because the state level surplus made. Uh, the ed fund more robust and now we can spend more per student uh, but gosh go ahead is, uh, is this okay uh, so when we hear that the legislature took money out of the education fund wow. mm -hmm. what they're really saying is that they cut back on the general yes. fund contribution contribution yeah. is that I mean I yeah. you know probably, you hear probably, that probably Probably. You know, yeah. we well, and another it depends how you say it because if we talk about universal school meals, we can talk about that being important too. 
but that universal school meals, it's maybe semantics, I don't know exactly. Did we pay for that out of the ed fund or did we just not put money in from the general fund? Right. Six one half dozen the other. Yeah, right? no, that makes sense um, actually. Well on the whole teacher's retirement piece. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's what I was saying. Is, is a part yeah, of this. Of the ed fund. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. being a retired Good teacher. Point. Good point. Good point. Okay. You know, sometimes they're not funding my retirement the way they ought to be. Or the future yeah. people. Okay, we're 75% of the way there. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm no, I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> That's an old man question. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> um, so Town B was the only one that was going to see their taxes increased a little bit because they may, or I didn't show you where budgets are, but Town B is the only town that has the own, their capacity to raise taxes to fund their schools. Yeah for their what's needed from the homestead fund. What happens if in December the state is polling districts and asking what do your increases look like? Those predict those projected increases in local budgets are a gap in what makes up the yield. So when the state says wow, we're hearing that districts are seeing 6%, 4%, 8% increases, we need to adjust our yield to account for that gap. So just like the state surplus pushed the yield up, gap uh, projected increases in local budgets brings it down because that's a gap in funding. So we don't have enough to cover that. So when we, when we say this is a statewide system, and if everybody increases their budgets across the state, even if we don't, the gap is in the yield and the ed fund and the right. yield affects right. us mm -hmm. because the yield changes our district tax rate, mm -hmm. um, which is a really interesting challenge with the system. And you could argue has created a system where the losers are the ones who are too conservative. Mm -hmm. yeah because you still take on some, some, and, and don't, don't get me wrong, not all of our towns feel it the same way. Uh, town B doesn't feel it in the same way, or sorry, Town A doesn't feel it as acutely because Town A didn't have the tax capacity anyway. Town A is getting helped out. Town B is the one that feels it the most. Because town B had the tax capacity, but because of everybody else's changes, you know. Um, that so. still depends upon their budget. Yeah. Um, the, the word yield, uh, according to the VSBA, yep. is based upon the equalized pupil amount across the state. So back to what Brian was sen yep. saying, if town A appropriates 15,000 per student, but town B does 20,000 per student, the average is 17,500. So there mm -hmm. would be an average of 17,500. Mm -hmm. You just said something though that made me think that I don't understand something. So <laughs> um, I hear you. Yeah. When you said it was based upon, but like when he was like, so town B would feel it more, and then you're like, well, it's based on their budget, but it's not. It's based. So if he backs up a couple of slides? It's based on their tax. Yeah, so not their budget. What? Okay. So right there, their localized budget per pupil spending? Yeah. I see. So it's it's that differential. If so the if they, yield goes below your per pupil spending, yeah. once the yield goes below your per pupil spending, you're impacted. So town A is the last one to get impacted. Yeah. Town A had the smallest capacity. So our towns that have the greatest need and the smallest capacity are affected last. Our affluent towns are affected first. Yeah. And that, but that's like no matter what that their budget is in some ways, right? So yeah. in well, the case of Town C, they have budgeted more than... Yeah, if their blue line was lower, if their blue line was lower, the yield wouldn't have even if impact it, on their big impact. Even, impact. even if you were to back up one more slide. I think so in the, in that situation town a is okay 
town B is pretty close, and town C, even though they're okay with their yield number, because they've raised enough taxes, they're still budgeting way too high. Yeah. I see. Okay, that helps that, that, thank you. So how does that, okay, you're getting there, common level of appraisal, that's, <laughs> yep. you know, because I just think about, 90%. I just <laughs> think about our four towns, yep. and they, yep, 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 yep. same budget, they all yep. had different so rates. Yep. This is all talking about district tax rate, district tax rate, district tax rate, our district tax rate for each town is the same. Why is our final tax rate, our town tax rate, different? Yeah. Um, everybody's reading ahead. I love it. Uh, <laughs> then common level of appraisal comes into play. Common level of appraisal is designed to make sure that towns are paying their fair share. If you have a town that has not been reassessed in 10 years, you could argue that they're not paying their fair share if a town was just reassessed and their property values went up, the town that hasn't been for 10 years, well, shouldn't their property values on paper be a little higher too? So CLA is the adjustment that is made at the state level to look at, at where towns are with assessments and to adjust them more appropriately so that a town couldn't just drag their feet on reassessments to keep taxes low. Uh, so the state intervenes and sets values and does crazy calculations to say, you know, your property values have gone up, but you haven't been reassessed, so your taxes are going to go up, uh, which is a little crazy. And I'll reiterate what Len's been saying for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> the state mm -hmm. is helping us, or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. and, and I think particularly when you look at and, and I had a conversation with a person the other day, and I know this is a little off tangent, but mm -hmm. it's not. Lives in Brandon, mm -hmm. and two houses in his neighborhood mm -hmm. were purchased by folks out of state. For a crazy amount. Okay. For an unbelievable, you know, they were originally $200,000. Yep. These folks bought them for like $600,000. Yep. yep. And so you say, well, that's just crazy. How can they do that? Well, they sold their house down south, not down south south, but a little lower south than Vermont, for over a million bucks. They come up here and it's no problem to buy. Yeah, $600,000 is a piece of cake when I just sold my house for a million dollars. And, and gosh, what a really compelling argument for why uh, property value might be challenge, more challenging than something like income-based. Yeah. Your income doesn't quite fluctuate the same way that property values can fluctuate. If you want a system that's stable and predictable so that folks know what their taxes are going to be, property, my, my property, property taxes are My hard. property yeah. is not worth anything yeah. unless someone is willing to buy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's worth nothing. It's worth zero. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And somebody is telling you... Yeah, that, that it's they, worth this well, amount of money. Might buy it for that, yeah. No different than a car, a baseball, yeah. anything. Any yeah. selectable. Josh? <laughs> uh, just one of the things, because we've experienced in Timmet a whole bunch. Of yeah. yeah. Yep. It, it is the, um, you know, you can't have outliers. So, like, if it is, like, in a town, if there are only, you know, a few sales that occur, it, that's when it's the hardest. But, like, you know, if there are a few houses that sell way out of line, you usually can petition those to get kind of knocked out. Um, it's when, like in our town, if there's like five houses and they all all the yeah. properties sell for a lot, then you get kicked, you, you you get hit really hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, good good point, Josh. Yeah. Is the I was just like looking it up because I remembered some yeah. like hearing something about it. This property transfer tax increase for second mm -hmm. home buyers mm -hmm. is that that's just like. Um, General fund, right? Probably. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, income sensitivity is another thing that comes in. If a resident's income is below a certain threshold, the homestead property value tax rate is based on income, not property value. Gosh, another reason why shouldn't we just go with income? <laughs> if for roughly 60 to 70 percent of Vermonters, we do base it on income, gosh, wouldn't it simplify it if we base it on income? Now we wouldn't have to adjust it for property value fluctuations. Um, 
Just an interesting thing as you think about dialing up your representatives. Uh, oh, but wait. There was an update. And this is something that was in the yield bill last year. CLA is still there. But the effect of CLA, mathematically, is going to be shifted into an earlier part of the formula. So this part where we said, don't worry, we're not to CLA yet. This is just our district tax rate. Part of CLA is going to raise our district tax rate. From the get-go? Yes. So let's just say, and I didn't do a graphic on this, I probably should have. Let's just say, instead of CLA increasing our tax rates 10 cents, we're gonna bump up our district tax rate five cents and CLA, guess what, goes up how many cents? Five. Yeah. So CLA is gonna have less of an effect because mathematically we're moving it, some of it over to the district tax rate. So you're gonna see a 10% increase, or sorry, a 10 cent, a 10 cent increase. Right. So Five of those cents are going to be in your district about tax About 10 rate. instead of a dollar? Is yes. that what you're saying? Where you said yeah. it's where, based on a dollar, it's going to be based where, on a dollar 10? So, for example, if I, if I said our district tax rate's a dollar, right? CLA might raise it in one town 10 cents, in one town 8 cents, in one town 7 cents. Now I'm saying our district tax rate's going to be a buck five, and it's going to raise three cents, two cents, one cent. So, so they shifted the effect of CLA into our district tax rate earlier. So how because a lot of a lot of people. Right. So in, in the case of, of uh, Tinmit, yep. that just had an appraisal. Yep. If if there is a, a CLA part of that dropped in earlier, doesn't that mean that they're getting over? tax or something? I mean, how does it work in that sort of thing? They had an appraisal last year. So mathematically, in the end, it's always going to be the same number. But some of that increase is going to just go into our di district tax rate to start. So Tinmith, Tinmith has had some large CLA swings. Tinmith is probably going to be having a very small CLA swing. Tinmith might see a district tax rate that is very close to the town tax rate if it's a small swing because that small CLA effect is going to be mostly in the district tax rate for them. Gotcha, so they might have an even smaller at the end. An CLA even that, smaller that change be between district and town, yes. Uh, and, and there was a lot of criticism in CLA and fluctuations and how that played out last year. And the way they chose to solve the problem was to- Make it more complicated. Yes. <laughs> which is frustrating because uh, that, you know, this is a history of things becoming more and more and more complicated at every step along the way, which is a little frustrating. So, yep. So I have a question about common level of appraisal. And oh, Stan's going to help us. When well, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> well, I just want okay, to Stan. clear up what's going to happen going forward yep. with the CLA. Mm -hmm. yep. If you took last year, for example, the yield was 9893 So you would take your... Per pupil spending, divide that by the 9893, get your district tax rate. And then the CLA would be applied to that. Now what they're doing is you're going to get, you're going to get your per pupil number, but they're going to take the average CLA number statewide first, which oh. last year was like 77%. So then they're going to come up with a yield number, let's say it was the 9893 last year. They'll times that by the 77 percent to come up with the yield adjusted number which would then go into your per pupil spending number to give you an increased district tax rate so. and then down below you'll take that out and come to where you would have been so part of CLA is going to affect the yield yield goes down taxes go up <laughs> makes tons of sense so you're right? going to end up where you ended up the same place yeah. it's just that you're going to shift the burden over to the district tax rate more than one of which <coughs> makes it look like it's our fault wait i was just that's what i'm curious is like what is the best way for us as a board yep. to talk to our community to kind of explain so like if they're seeing 
a large, what looks like a large yep. budget increase. Yep. I don't, yeah, like how do we talk about what is actually what we're in control of and what we don't have it. I, I think a, a, a thing that we can do uh, is be very intentional about some of the language that we're using. I, I think tonight we need to have as much of an understanding as we can. And I think the public needs to see us wrestling with understanding this. So for okay. example, for example to, to, to further explain on that is that under this new way of doing it at the 77%, I think Clarendon was pretty close to the 70% range for their CLA number. So technically, whatever we had for district rate would get passed on to Clarendon. So the explanation would have been the, the responsibility of that tax rate relied slowly, slowly with the district. You know, your CLA number was 78%. Your the statewide was 78%. So it's, after the CLA number gets adjusted, it's still going to be the same district tax rate. Because now, at, and now you can't say, oh, the CLA number caused your tax increase. Well, it's the school, CLA brought it's our the, number up. It's the school, no, the it's the school the spending up, right? is what caused the uh, yeah. tax rate. Well, can, can, can we back up for just one second? Can you tell me, I, I'm not clear on what the yep. common level of appraisal is. Yep. I, is that... It's, is that a state number of what house's number. property is worth? So that everybody then, pays the same, approximately the same on their assessed value of their home. So like you and Clarendon, you have a $200,000 home, you pay $2,000 taxes on it for school taxes. The town over from you has a hundred and fifty, has an assessed value of one hundred fifty, let's say 100000 and their CLA is 50%. Uh, so. They don't, they're only going to pay a thousand dollars tax, but then attached to that CLA number, that brings it up to the two thousand. So it's that assessed well, value that because that hundred thousand is probably not accurate. Yeah, but I mean, so I just think it's, property it's to values. make it fair. If you're going to do a statewide system, you got to somehow come up with a fair way that everybody's paying the same. So is it fair? So how is it fair? If you can explain this, good luck. That you know, property in um, uh, Stowe, Vermont, you know, or, or just in this area, Killington, Vermont, is, you know, sells for a lot more. They've got million dollar houses all over the place. And then in Clarendon, we got a few, but not as many And Shrewsbury. You know, I mean, so if they say, the property value, the, is it like an average of all of the property values all over the state? Or how do they come up with that appraisal number, I guess? Oh, Josh has, Josh knows. I don't know if I know, but <laughs> this is, this is, uh, to my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that what the CLA number is for your town is that you have a, your, the values of your town should be worth a certain amount. You had a bunch of, like, in, let's say you had a bunch of sales that were above mm -hmm. the assessed values mm -hmm. in your town. The average, yeah. The difference between what the assessed value is and the value that they're selling for, sort, that oh. percentage oh. is what CLA is. There you go. Gotcha. So, so, yeah. so there, and there's, there's high CLA and low CLA, and it's the, you, you so they're equating saying, oh, actually, your property values should be here, mm -hmm. but you you are art you have you haven't got appraised or whatever. Yours are artificially low. Right. So we're going to say your tax base is actually up here. Yeah. You can or afford. Or you had a bunch of property that sold for way under what your appraisal is, then you're saying, oh, actually, your values are too high. So then you change it, and what happens is. There's a trigger point. They made it smaller. It might be 10% now. I think it used to be 15 or something. Where it says, "Oh, you're you're really out of whack. You have to do a real appraisal." Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, more than half the towns in Vermont have to do appraisals right now. And that's there's happened. a and there's a long waiting list for yeah, there is. reappraising. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, Tinmith just got reassessed. They should not have a lot of fluctuation next year, like Stephen was kind of hinting at. Because they were just reassessed, right. they should be close to where they're supposed right, to be. Right, but the individual property owners mm -hmm. will have their taxes go up because they're now a, 
assessed at a higher level. They did this year. Well, they did this year. Yeah. They yeah, already they, did. That went into effect this year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so next year. So the state doesn't need to make the adjustment because the town reassessed and made the adjustment. <laughs> yeah, the town treasurer did. Fake I already received the unrealized got their bills. benefits <laughs> or whatever. Um, okay. So I'm guessing you don't have another slide. Uh, no. So uh, but I, I want to get back to Kim's question. Go ahead. Um, and, and then I, I think, have one more. I think today the, the public seeing that we're doing our due diligence and trying to understand this so that we can do the best job we can with what we have and what we're facing and the system that we have to work in, number one. Number two, we need to be talking as, as a board about how do we communicate this? Mm -hmm. And I think that's not tonight. That's, we, <laughs> we come up with some, some, think about it. <laughs> some ways to share with folks what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that becomes how we educate folks on how this complicated stuff is affecting our district. Um, and I think that's work in progress. And, and I think one of the things we have to be clear on, and I'm sorry, I keep coming back to this, but it, it's not simple, number one. I can't explain it to you in a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair to say to a, to a taxpayer who comes to me yeah. as a board member and asks. If you could explain it in five, you'd be lucky. Uh, I know. Well, I couldn't explain it in a day and a half. <laughs> but, but, but the other part is, and I, and I think we need to make it, clear is that we do our best mm -hmm. with what we have control over I think that's important and and we do that by saying you know like we did last year we presented a reason the, the best reasonable budget we could mm -hmm. all these other factors come in and and here you have it mm -hmm. And, and I, so I think that's important, that there's some things we as a board can control, and there's some things we can't. And, and those things, you know, Dave Bosch was here the other night, and that's what he was looking for. What, what do you want me to bring back to Montpelier? Mm -hmm. I, 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 Simplify the system. I, I can't Simplify say the system. contact your legislator enough. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. That leads me to my next point. Yeah. Um, January-ish, mm -hmm. uh, the governor appointed a group yeah. in Montpelier yeah. yep. to assess uh, our education mm -hmm. financing. And mid-December, if people are keeping track of when things come out, mid-December, um, that group will be presenting to the governor and to the people in Montpelier their findings. Yeah. And based upon that, they will take action. So mm -hmm. we need to come up with a budget and present it to our constituents. Mm -hmm. yep. um, likely before they say, hey, we're going to make changes. Mm -hmm. oh. Just like they did this year. I also just want to shout out, Stephen, your, what you wrote to put in um, our Shrewsbury Times mm -hmm. that he shared out for everybody. Like, that's mm -hmm. a great way to. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you, Kim. I'm going to plan on, oh, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to plan on trying to keep, uh, maybe, writing a communication like that each month anyway and sending it out for folks to repost if they would like um, because I think what we're getting to here is what we can do as a board is just educate the public on how this works as much as possible. I think, uh, and I, I, I feel personally that we get a little bit too much into the politics and too much uh, we, we talk about our frustrations and we talk about whether this is valuable or not, I think more than we need to. Um, it just is what it is. <laughs> this is. This is the system and we're working with it and I think we can just try and be clear with folks that this is what we have control over, these are the things we don't, and we're doing the best we can to run um, the system for the school district as best we can and meet our goals and be responsible to the taxpayers while we do that. Um, I, I understand why this, you know, the state has decided to use the CLA and all these sort of things, and it makes some theoretical sense to me personally. Um, I don't know if this is the best way to do it. It's very, very complicated, um, but I think they're striving for equity um, in the state, and it's a nice thing to strive for, but it's messy. 
Stephen, can could did you send that um, piece out to all the board members? I, yes, I believe I did. Yes, I tried to, it was a while ago, though. I, I was, I was, it was September 19th. I can okay. forward it to you. And Thank you. Josh. Um, one of the things, I have a lot of spare time right now, so I was watching the, the FDA uh, video that Brian uh, had earlier today, and one of the things that um, I watched earlier, but I forgot that, and it's an important point that uh, the presenter makes, is that as board members, during the vote, we're actually just, we can tell people about what's going on, but we can't really advocate as, a, as our board member roles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, That's you can point. point people to how you voted on the budget, but when you're describing, when you're talking about the budget, especially during voting season, is, is you, you really you have to use the verbiage of like, you know, we want you to come out and vote. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here is the information about it, but you can't really, you have to remember to, you know, it's not, it's not your role to, to, to advocate. That's and, and, you know, if, if people saw my front porch forum post, you know, the end of that post was pretty intentional about saying, if you want more local control, if you want more state level control, let your representatives know that, because I'm not, I'm not going to advocate for one or the other right. of those two options. Uh, just like when I send my final budget note to folks, probably in January ish, uh, I'll say. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm going to ask you please vote. And I think that's that's an important. Uh, the board needs to operate in a way, you know, like Josh said, that we are putting the best budget we can forward. We are doing the work along the way to show folks, you know. And I think you got a great point, Len. We need to tell people that we're doing the best we can. Tonight is showing them what that work looks like to do the best we can. Um, so that they trust not just what we're saying because they see what we're doing. Um, and then we encourage them to come out and vote and we see what happens. Well, I think the hardest thing for people to understand is the increase in their tax rate has nothing to do with the budget in, in a way. You know, I mean. Because it doesn't have a lot to do with it. Doesn't, I mean, you know, it's the, the budget, even if it's level funded, mm -hmm. chances are your taxes will go up. And your, your town taxes yeah, are your probably going well, up too and contributing to your property taxes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's hard to separate the two out. It's a lot of math. Well, it's just because it's the state is just doing this big averaging thing over the whole state, so our local budget, I don't, if, I'm not sure we, where it goes into we, the average. If we are fiscally responsible and nobody else is, yeah. chances are it will go up. Yeah, unless we're an eight town. We can keep trying to do the best we can, and we'll keep working together to come up with good yeah. communication. Okay. Well, I really it's appreciate helpful. this yeah. Very tonight. Helpful. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I, I said, I, I might need a tutorial, okay. but it was a well, very and, good first and, lesson. And something I, I try to encourage people: if you're talking to folks and they they're asking you for more, and you're saying it's really complex. Send them our way. We'll sit down. We'll spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes giving them a tutorial too. So if the public really wants to know, and you feel like you've given them everything you can, send them in. Absolutely, I will always talk to the public. So the budget forum. Yep. That are you going to yep. no. do this or something like if, this? If or? I did this at the budget forum, it would be me talking, and I really want to be mindful that that we hear from them. If they want yeah. to watch this, they can watch this. In, in, the, in the past, I think the budget for forums have yeah. done just that, yeah. in that we've heard from the community members that were there what they want. And I think questions pop up, and we, we dip our toes in some of this, mm -hmm. but we don't just, let's spend yeah, 45 minutes yep. cranking through it, um, which I, I feel like I can do with all of you. <laughs> Thanks. I wonder <laughs> if, no, I know, but I wonder if, I wonder if, Yep. Um, if you did kind of a video with, I don't know if we have a little video. What, what we've um, done. But, and then put it on the website. What we've if done in the past is we've told folks, 
Look at the X date meeting on Peg TV because we yeah, go no, no, it. I mean yeah. some, a production, yeah. <laughs> almost like if the I don't know what yeah. Mill River has in terms of or if yeah. you you know or even Stafford or yeah. um, Peg TV they do you, little I, shows. The the challenge we, would we just need, be we need a schoolhouse rock of a budget. <laughs> there you go. That's what I'm talking about. The, the, <laughs> Carol, I think that's an awesome idea. The only challenge is the. Who's going to do it and when are they going to do it? Because we, we run out of time. Well, yeah. you just did this for us in yeah. 45 minutes. If you could pair it back because it wouldn't well, be there, questions. But, but there's but video editing. There's, yes. I mean, well, that's and, why and I mean, if you yeah. see the video and the video is 30 minutes long, it took yeah. three days to put the video. No, I understand yeah. that. That's why I was wondering if there was a high school student or. Yeah. Um, you know, someone at yep. Stafford. Yeah. I don't if know if they a, have their if video. If we had a program media program, was, absolutely. There but but you, there, <laughs> even we're, we're talking about a 45 minute production yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, if you just go through those slides, it's only 15 minutes. If we well, didn't don't ask have, me how long it took me to put it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. And, and I, I think that's the important yeah. piece is that for some, for a person, for a local individual who has no background in budgets, and I mean, we don't necessarily have a lot, yeah. um, <clears throat> to look at this mm -hmm. and expect them to understand it yeah. ain't gonna happen. I mean, I, I, and I'm not, <laughs> I'll say this publicly, I'm not chastising any of the community members. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, even for us, well, I go. Who, who have some experience in this, and, and I go bug Stan, and I go, Stan, can I run a slide past you? Uh -huh. <laughs> is, is, I do sense? every year. Absolutely. Because, because I have to refresh my memory and make sure I'm not missing something, and I need somebody who, who knows it really incredibly well to check yeah. and make sure I'm not yeah. forgetting or missing. This isn't simple stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, um, I, you know, I would love to do some of that stuff. I think the challenge is it just becomes capacity. You know, we're a small district and we all wear a lot of hats and we, we run out of time to do well, some of those I, things. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. I really do. I was just thinking about the two gentlemen who did come to our um, community yeah. conversations and they both, I mean, yeah. David's running for um, the house, so he mm -hmm. obviously is going to mm -hmm. get a bunch of this but the other gentleman really just was interested in how yep. it, mm -hmm. because he was a um he's a lister for the town mm -hmm. of clarendon and he just he knows what he, you know about the appraisal and all of that he just didn't know how the pieces fit and i and i'm not saying that yep. everybody and would be interested in that josh no fair i'm sorry go ahead oh no i was just gonna just reframe up like you know the the conversations around the budget you know, like one of the key, we heard one of the outcomes of tonight with Kim and the, you know, the elementary school, like soccer program, mm -hmm. you know, that really got pushed through. We had conversations outside of that meeting, but then, you know, we had people come into those meetings and talk about it. And so it's like, I feel like that is, for those meetings, that really is the place for those advocates to show up and do that. I got you. Versus you know, us trying to educate them. It's part of the conversation, but it is just one of those avenues of like, here, the board has these goals, the admin has these goals. Are there people in the community that have energy that also have some, wants, have some asks? Yeah, that and, makes sense. You know, and we had a conversation, like, you know, we talked last year, the year before, and we had a really good conversation about how, like, paras and interventionists help the whole spectrum uh, of students and of why funding those positions was important. So you get into okay. some education pieces, but it is, I think it's more about try, just trying to hear what the community wants. Well, gotcha. that, that's how we started the program mm -hmm. um, down in the tech ed area. That, that was a direct yep. Absolutely. ask Absolutely. of the community. Mm -hmm. that was, uh, it's been how we did woodshop back too. Yeah. We were like, well, I think that's what we got rid of woodshop. Talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's why I think good examples of why I think it's important for us to be careful with the language we use around budgets. 
uh, and budgeting. Because some of these things, we're, if, if we're talking about things that are you know, community focused or, or community created and, and goal um, priorities for, for our district, like we want to create this huge shop class and everyone in the community is behind it, you know, we would budget in a way that potentially would have the budget go up. We're not going to cut everything else so that the budget stays flat in a, in a situation like that, right? So I think it's important to think about just the way that we talk about it and not just, oh, you know, we're trying to do zero all the time forever. Um, we're trying to to set goals and maybe create an amazing district, and we're trying to do that in the most responsible way we can. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I think that's the the message has always been we're doing the best we can and being mindful of the impact. You know, we lead with we're doing the best we can because our students come first, right? Mm -hmm. And we're being mindful of our communities. And, and, and we need to make that point that, that we are trying to provide the best educational opportunities we can for our kids and you can punch numbers and crunch numbers and do all of that but in the end what's it doing for our kids mm -hmm. and and we sit here and we say that but i think sometimes it, it gets lost as adults and i'll, I'll just mm -hmm. speak for myself mm -hmm. that as an adult i tend to forget <laughs> you know we've got seventh and eighth graders out there that you know what are we doing how are we helping them what are we doing for them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't had a real difficult time in passing a budget mm -hmm. is because the community trusts mm -hmm. the board to put the best interests mm -hmm. interests of the kids yeah. first and I and I yeah. you know I know mm -hmm. this is some people look at it as baloney but yeah. that's the only reason I'm here mm -hmm. is for those kids that's the only reason. And, and we're a district where you're not going to see our administrators traveling cross country to go to a conference and no. be put up in hotels. I mean, we haven't done that in years. But when somebody, when the community and our students are asking about wood shop opportunities, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. We're not going to, we're not going to um, find ways to, to make the budget work for us. We're finding ways to make the budget work right. for our kids. Right and do it in a way that's efficient it's, and mindful of our community. Yeah. But that's the, that's the second part. The first part is what are we doing for our students? I think that matters. And that's, Kim, I think some of the messaging that is important for everybody to be able to you know, show that we're trying to understand this so we can do the best that we can. Yeah. And we really are having those conversations like last night, finance around, well, what are the open positions? What's best for students? How are we going to serve our students with these positions? Which are the ones we really need? I think that's important. Well, I have a feeling we could talk about this all night. Oh, yeah. But uh, oh, yeah. if no one else opposes, I think we will <laughs> move to the next topic. Thank you, Brian. That was very helpful. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you for, well, I appreciate the questions, the engagement. Um, that, that matters a lot. Uh, so next topic on the agenda is community conversations update. Well, I think I've already discussed the two people that we had who came um, to the um, to the conversation. Um, I think I'll go to my notes. How about that? Because I can't remember anything. Um, You know, I, I think we got input again. The input we got was that um, that the one person was particularly hearing that um, we have kids, we're graduating kids that aren't meeting competence, that test scores are below the state average, and, and you know, what are we getting for the money that we're investing? Um, I think, Brian, were you there? You weren't there, but... No. Um, um, somebody was saying you have to be careful about looking at these test scores and we talked a little bit about how test scores don't aren't the whole story that wasn't thank you that was Nick Len and I tossed it back and forth yeah yeah so that was great and they and and he was good with that and um, 
But that was it. We really didn't get a big turnout. And I, you know, I was really hoping that we would hear, you know, how people thought school started and how the opening was, but we didn't get any of that. Well, yeah. I was going to say, too, I think one of the reasons why we put it on the agenda for tonight was also to, for feedback of, like, how are we going to follow up with some of the questions that, because we didn't have answers for everything, and we knew that we weren't going to, like, we just, there's some things that we just can't, um, put in a neat box for people um but yeah just thinking through maybe what that process should be with the larger board of like with these community conversations want to touch base with the larger board mm -hmm. to be able to then offer to close that loop with the community members that came is that kind of how mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um you know and then we had one parent who came and and she also was wondering about classes mainly at the upper levels and I think we kind of talked a little bit about that when Sean came and he talked about the flexible pathway so I think um, I don't I don't know I didn't feel like for this meeting there was a lot of feedback or questions to answer I think we kind of answered it but in the future I think what Kim is saying how do we want to handle getting back to people because we didn't like get contact information or anything even if we wanted to get back to them how you know so maybe definitely I was thinking we should get contact information emails or um, addresses if you know to to get back to them about their questions um, yeah I think I get we get a lot more input if we attend school mm -hmm. events and people come and talk to you about things that are on their minds but we'll try again I think um, I don't know if this is the place to bring it up but the budget forums I think will be our community conversations for the next uh, for this month and then we can talk about we have our meeting well when we get down to committee reports I'll talk a little bit more how's that beautiful uh, that brings us to the bylaws draft. So everyone received this uh, with plenty of warning, required of five days, I believe. Because mm -hmm. we made a slight change last meeting. Yep. So that slight change is in there. If I remembered what that slight change is. Uh, I was reading through be it before this meeting and but I don't. it didn't jump out at me. Does anybody remember what that was? I made the change. It was under it was under personnel, but I can't yep. remember what it was. Okay. Wasn't there something about superintendents uh, high, with their um, uh, sorry, not just superintendents, something about contracts of like things being negotiated by certain yep. policies. Says we we right. said <laughs> that new administrators, their salaries, it all is coming back to me. So um, newly hired, newly now. hired there administrators, their you. salaries are um, uh, spoken to when we hire them. Recommended compensation packages for newly hired administrative right. positions right. under roles and responsibilities. And yeah. it, it read all administrators. We changed it to be Correct. newly hired. Yes. Yeah. Great, great. I had forgotten that. Thank you. Ooh. Um, I have I have a request in terms of this. Um, community engagement did not have a chance to meet, and I I would like to figure out the roles and responsibilities for community engagement. But Carol, so, oh sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, remember we talked about that we can do that at any point. Okay. And then just have just have to prove this edit. Yeah, just if we want to, we can improve it. Because we talked about that at finance last night, or didn't talk about it because we, 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 ran, we, we ran out of time. Yeah, yeah, we ran out of time. Oh yeah, so finance is gonna. So all of the other yeah, committees are gonna do it. it. I mean, Stephen gave them to us, but we just didn't. Okay. Get all right. Around I'm, to I'm it. good. Yeah. So I have a question about the document that was sent out, the bylaws. There are things that are highlighted. Are those new things? Those from? are the changes. Okay. So more details, basically, of. Okay. So 
all the roles and responsibilities we can change? We can change, but we need to bring it to the board five days before yeah, okay. a board okay. vote, okay. and it's still got to be so we can approve three this. quarters. Yes, yeah. doing the roles and responsibilities. Do it again and do it again. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. That's great. I just wanted to clarify that. So I'll make a motion that we accept the bylaws as amended. I'll second it. Beautiful. Uh, any discussion? <laughs> what? Even though we started with the sorry, <laughs> I, I'm not an, I'm not good I'm not a good order person. Uh, seeing none. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Next is the bus driver substitute rate and placement table. You or Len? Sorry. Oh, that'll be me. Yep. Uh, so we talked in personnel a little bit about this because it's uh, an update to how we would be compensating folks. Uh, we have not been able to update our bus driver sub. Uh, placement table or sub rate for a little while because doing so would uh, potentially have us hiring new folks at higher rates than existing folks uh, and that is not great for morale for our existing folks we want to take care of our existing folks uh, last year because our bus drivers are non-union but we tend to extend to them the same benefits as our support staff because our support staff had a 5% raise coming into this year, we recommended a 5% raise for our bus drivers as well. So they started this year off with that. Uh, doing that two years in a row gave us a, a good range so that we could update our placement table. So that's why we're bringing that to you tonight. That's not negotiated because it's non-union, but that's something that we look at what we are paying current people and we can figure out what we can pay new people to keep everything in order to update that table. That is something that doesn't come at a cost to the district right now, that's within our budget. So were we to uh, hire a new bus driver or replace a bus driver or something like that, we should be within our budget and able to make that work. Uh, so this is just updating this so that when we do, high, well, when we advertise, we can advertise higher rates. The sub rate historically has been step one of the bus driver table. Uh, we have, have, I think, a fantastic system with Connie as our backup driver. So we have not called in sub drivers because Connie uh, can far more consistently cover because she has the CDL. That's been an arrangement we didn't have in the past. Having that is huge because sub bus drivers are <coughs> harder to find than regular bus drivers and regular bus drivers are really hard to find. Uh, but we would ask for the board to approve a substitute rate just so that we have one and to approve this new placement table. In, in <coughs> well, for purposes of discussion, I'll yes. make a motion that we accept this bus driver placement table. And substitute rate. And substitute rate. If you don't mind. Thank as you. you said. <laughs> I will second it. Thank you. Discussion. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, where is 2670 the substitute rate? Yes. That would be the substitute rate. Th that would rate be the substitute rate. For. Okay. And then the others, a, a bus driver would be placed on here based on their years of experience. Correct. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Any more discussion? I, I can can we label that twenty six seventy as the substitute rate besides just being step yeah. one? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. I, I just think that's important mm -hmm. that people understand mm -hmm. that if they're going to be a sub, that's what they're going to get, mm -hmm. no Absolutely. matter what. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? 
Awesome. Thank you, everybody. So that brings us to committee reports and personnel. Yeah. Just got rid of one of my things right there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes, we met tonight. Um, and I, I just want to share it with the full board. Um, last night in finance, we talked about the administrator's salaries moving forward because they don't have a salary for the next fiscal year. Um, and so fi in their, their, I just wanted to make finance, which they were aware of, obviously, um, but also um, in the personnel committee to understand that that was something we were going to need to work with and I know community engagement has as well, working with the finance committee to decide what those next steps are. And I think that's an important piece um, because it's a little different from the way things have been done in the past. So I just set that out there. Um, so I have a couple of contracts. Um, I'd like to make a motion to offer a contract to Catherine Lewis 1.0 full-time equivalency educational support staff at Clarendon Elementary School. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, um, I'd like to make a motion to offer a contract to Julian to Campos, um, 1.0 full-time equivalency educational support staff at Mill River. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next is a letter of resignation from Roxanne Green, um, special educator at Wallingford Elementary School. And her resignation takes effect October 4th. So I would make a motion that we accept the resignation from Roxanne Green. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, discussion right just so folks know I have contacted Roxanne mm -hmm. and um, to set up an exit interview and so that process is moving forward um, I'll talk with board members um, to see she would like to meet this Friday if anybody has time on Friday and would like to meet um, that would be great if not uh, let me know and I'll get back to her again what we've done in the past with exit interviews is met it's been myself as chair of the personnel committee usually not always um, and also another board member and I sent her back an email asking if there's any board member that she would prefer to meet with um, so that's in process I just want to folks to know that okay do you want people just to contact you via email sure right there? that'd oh. be great any other discussion all those in favor opposed abstain thank you very much um, we also in personnel and I think everybody actually received this all board members um, just looking at we hired the two support staff that are listed um, Catherine Lewis and Julian de Campos and then where we are at this point speech language pathologist special educator special education para educator and foreign language K6 so and I appreciate Brian you know I think this is helpful for us in personnel and for the full board to just get an idea of where we're at mm -hmm. in terms of personnel mm -hmm. so I absolutely thank yeah. you for that yeah. thank you for asking for it 
<laughs> then I knew to do it for you. <laughs> uh, sometimes I ask too much, but that's okay. No, no. Um, you can and always that's ask. The next, <laughs> the next meeting is actually written down somewhere November 6th. I think it's the 6th. 6th. Yeah. 6th. Mm -hmm. Six. At 6.30. That's it for me. Uh, so moving on to policy. Policy, we have not met uh, since last meeting. Our next meeting will be uh, next Tuesday, yep. uh, this uh, December, uh, <laughs> October 8th <laughs> not yet. at uh, 5.30 p.m. Uh, buildings and grounds, we met yesterday. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like so long ago. <laughs> um, we didn't get through our entire list. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about big pro budget projects and how that would impact uh, finance and budget. Um, we will continue those discussions and make a priority list so that things can get approved and so that we can update some things that need updating. I don't think we set a date for next meeting. Oh, I thought we were going to do a month. In, uh, from I'll report back to the next meeting yeah. I think that'd be November I think. oh that'd be election day yeah um, that's just forget that Oof. I'll report back at the next meeting okay. uh, community engagement um, <clears throat> well we kind of already did our update um, our next meeting will be um, oh wait I made notes I decided that this works better if I write down what I need to say um, our next meeting will be October 16th, and it's in Shrewsbury, is that correct? Yes, Shrewsbury 1016. And um, that'll be at, mm, 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 I don't know what time, I'm thinking um, maybe 6.15, uh, maybe 6 o'clock. Can everybody make it? Because I want to go through the roles and responsibilities and get that underway in some other um, things so I think we might need the hour we got kind of cut off last well, time if not, we can just roam around <laughs> yeah there we go we'll figure it out and then I just wanted to highlight um, the budget forums uh, first one is October 9th 6 to 7 at I think in Mill River right Brian yeah, in the library in the yeah. library and then the next one is October 17th 3 30 to 4 30 in the library if anybody wants to you. come to those yeah. And um, also, uh, the school, Pat has updated the school activity calendar for October, which I had all ready to share with everybody. So I will just wanted you to know that that was coming. It's just a shared um, spreadsheet. And I just, I was wondering about sending it to school principals because it's going to be, at, it's, it, you're able to edit it. Everybody's an editor. So if you know of any events that aren't on there, or you, you can add them. And then we'll try and Pat has is going to update it every month mm -hmm. um, to try you know so you guys can refer to that and that's it. And, oh, and our next meeting I already said so I think that's it. Do we have have you sent that to us the updated calendar? No, I haven't. Okay. I wanted to let you know it was coming. Okay, that's fine. That's what I thought you said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, finance. Ah, that's me. Yay, Steve. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so we had a meeting last night, um, and actually it wasn't even about what Brian just shared this entire time. <laughs> it was about entirely other stuff. Um, so yeah, we, we were going through, basically Brian and Stan came and presented um, the kind of a first initial rollover budget as if we were basically just rolling over everything from this uh, previous fiscal year to, 2020, to the 26th year. Um, and in that we started a lot of discussion about particular um, pieces to consider. Brian mentioned some of that. We're looking at things like um, vacant staff positions that have been in our budget that we should consider whether or not they roll over to the 26 budget or they are dropped out of the 26 budget. Um, with this uh, budget summary um, from like a kind of estimated rollover budget, we um, 
looking at something, I did a little bit of math after the fact, just plugging in a few numbers for, for some percentages we didn't have last night. Um, I plugged in some numbers for, we know what the teacher salary increase is for 26, and I plugged in some numbers for the admin salary and support staff potential increases. Um, and we're somewhere looking at um, a potential variance of about four and a, uh, three and a half to four and a half, four, four and three quarters percent um, from this, this kind of rollover budget increase. So the, we basically, the Finance Committee has asked um, Stan and Brian to um, do some, make some proposal kind of forecast budgets that look at either something in the 0%, what might that look like, 0% increase, or something in the 2% uh, increase. And we're gonna look, look at those, I think, in our possibly next meeting, <laughs> Upco upcoming, sometime this month in October. Um, how's that sound so far, Brian? Is yep. That? yep. The only thing I would add is when when Stephen is saying the three four percent two percent zero percent that's overall expenditure increase. So our full budget um, when we did a rollover budget uh, three and a half ish percent increase is what we see. So we're going to bring proposals for a two and a, a two percent and a zero percent to look at. Yeah. Um, Just because there are there are a lot of different places we look at percentage increases, percent increase of tax rate, percent increase of per pupil spending, percent increase of entire budget. So I just wanted folks to know what those percentages were of. Fair. Yes, thank you. And, and Brian, Brian, let us know that at this point last year, that number of that three point four seven that Stan and Brian brought was closer to six seven. and a half, seven. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, so clarifying, but also, Stephen. There information from uh, I believe the, the governor's letter indicating that, that there could be another what four on top of that. So four percent is likely because, like we were talking about earlier, a surplus that was there last year that's not going to be there this year could lead to about a four percent increase. Uh, and he was also identifying that health care could lead to about a three percent increase. Seven. That gives us the seven from the governor's letter. Uh, we have health care worked into our rollover budget. So right. we, we worked in a 15% increase, hoping that it's not going to be that. Mm -hmm. So we still, there's this, uh, this question of that lack of surplus. Is that going to be an extra 4% when we go to calculate district tax rate based on the yield? In other words, is the yield going to be down so our tax rate goes up because of that lack of surplus? So that might look like a 4%. Um, is the 0 and 2% um, that you're asking to see, is that, would that be on top of the 3 to 3.5 three to 4.5 increase that we know is there? Or that's like to look at how to? These yeah. would be three separate proposals. These would yep. be three separate proposals. Um, a 0% would mean, you know, a, yeah. a fair number of okay. cuts. 2% would be some cuts. The 3% is no cuts. <clears throat> All right. The other piece, the other piece was Stan came in. You mentioned Brian earlier. Stan came with a quarterly report, and there wasn't all that much to report other than we may, if we project it out after from our point in time this year in the fiscal year, that we may be looking at a, a sizable surplus at the end of this fiscal year. Yep. So uh, Stan's report, you're, you're right, Stephen, there's not a lot to report except we're in good shape. And actually, we have surplus this year. So projected. Projected surplus. Yep. Great. I think that pretty well covers, uh, generally, quickly, our meeting from last night. Um, I will try to write up. Uh, another write-up on this and get this sent out to all all y'all and yeah our next and we have a lot of meetings coming up I believe uh, oh wait before we move on past that we have payroll all right we have 
mayoral warrants. <clears throat> First, uh, September 27th, in the amount of 634,026 and The second, of October 1st, in the amount of 7,396 and 15 cents, for a total of 641,422.92 cents. Move for the board to approve these payroll warrants. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. All right, excellent. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Sorry, somebody can help me count. You're good. <laughs> good, thank you. And for our accounts payable warrants, we have from the general fund in the amount of $936,876.24. Another general fund, $11,146.11. ASP for $433.26. And lunch in the amount of $11,159.63. Our total there of $959,615.24. We also have student activity for Mill River in the amount of $250. For um, uh, Finman in the amount of $357. And from Wallingford in the amount of $545 for a total of $1,152. A motion to accept these payroll warrants. I second it. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? You're good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so our next meetings, and we have our final. We have um, budget forms coming up, that's correct? Yep. Uh, 9th and 17th. 9th and 17th. 6 o'clock okay. and 3.30. And at this point, Brian, you suggested maybe we're doing finance meetings every, we're doing them more. Yeah, I, more I wonder percent. about, I wonder about maybe Tuesday the 29th of October. Because we will have we will have okay. time to have met with departments and principals and gone over budgets. And you'll have the community forums. And you'll have we'll have both forms. of our community forums wrapped up. Yep. I think that timing is reasonable to keep the ball rolling and not delay too much. If that works for folks. That works for me. That's my that's a three. The twenty ninth, you said. What time? We want to do five thirty again? We want to do five because there's maybe no B and G then, or do the B and G at five again? Five thirty. I think we just put it at five thirty in okay. case B and G decides to okay. want to slip into that five o'clock spot. Yep. Okay. Great. Everyone. That's all right. Yep. Sounds good. I would love yeah. to steal that five o'clock spot. Okay. Uh, that's all I've got for you all now. Uh, so next on the list is transact other legal business, and we need to got, approve oh, yes. somebody else to sign. And if uh, Nick can sign as clerk, but let's get somebody to sign on behalf of the board because Josh is virtual. <coughs> I'll volunteer again. I did it last time. Um, so I would make a motion that uh, Carol sign on behalf of the board chair. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I've got one quick one. All just unanimous. Just a Thank heads you. up. Uh, food service contract is going to be up. So Stan is working on the RFP now. So it's likely in January we're going to be asking board members to participate in the process of selecting a vendor for food service. So keep that in the back Are of your heads. Tasting? 
Yeah, that's what I was Potentially, saying. we we'll talk to Stan. We'll we'll figure out a good process for it. That's but we, what I was wondering. When we do that, we 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 want to have as many folks involved as we can, and we would love to have some board members involved. So keep that in the back of your heads. For January, we'll get a formal request out to you. We'll email you, but be thinking about it. Are you um, doing any kind of info gathering from students of just like what how they're feeling about we, it? We will be, absolutely. I know our current food service vendor does survey and do some engagement that way, but as we do our selection process, we'll try to involve parents, we'll try to involve board members, principals, we'll try and get a good panel of folks to make that decision. Is, is there a, could folks go and visit, not folks, yep. students, yep. go and, uh, you know, visit uh, another school where another vendor is serving? I don't know. I don't know. And I think we, uh, we would have to be careful, too, that we do the process in a way that everybody has equal access. Right. Uh, but we can explore that. Absolutely. I, for yeah. is it yes. Shrewsbury and Shrewsbury and Tin Myth. Tin Myth. Oh, okay. I just, their own programs. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I was curious, is it is yeah. it Stan's here? Well it's just gonna answer Lance's Lance. Yep. Lance oh, okay. yeah, yes, that's been done in the past. You just have to contact the school or whatever ahead of time to let them know Yeah. Yeah. I just see I, I know it's yeah. worked yeah. to have kids go mm -hmm. and you know let let that because they're the ones that what, what do they say the proof is in the pudding yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um is it a good time to just check in with shrewsbury tenmouth to see how they're feeling about doing their independent okay yep yep i think that's something we can write into the rfp that we want to look for vendors who would be willing to do that and we can have those conversations to see what those programs would look like uh, and we can we can wade through that, and and I think not uh, us make a decision, and we're just going that way. Sure. But we can yeah. do the work to figure out if it makes sense or not. Yeah. You know, in the past, like Mill River here, um, when we had some in-house and then contracted came in, we kept our in-house staff. They were union, so we had to keep our in-house staff. So we partnered with the contracted services. We kept our in-house staff. So there are some ways that we could, you know, preserve a lot of what's there, but we could maybe find some efficiencies with purchasing and things like that that would come through contracted services. But that's a conversation we can have. Yeah, it's a good, good question. Sarah, do you have a question or is that left over your hand up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So that's just uh, sorry. <laughs> just a heads up. Be thinking about if you'd like to participate in that. That's all uh, I got. Any other? Um, I have just a couple things. I'll be brief. First of all, I would like to apologize to the new staff folks mm. because I was not at the meet and greet last Thursday, mm. and. I'm a huge proponent of that, and then I don't show up. <laughs> um, I spaced. What can things, I say? Things happen. But but I I do want to apologize, and and I also want to emphasize how important I think that time is to meet with the new folks in the district. Um, so I will continue to push for it, and I hope the next one I can remember to show up at. I'll call you next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing I need. Um, the, the only other thing I, I have is I got a thing from Blue Cross Blue Shield because that's who I get my insurance from. And, mm -hmm. and it, they told me my insurance was going up 10%. Mm -hmm. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for both of those. And, and thanks to, I was going to say something and I totally forgot, so thank you, Len. Thank you to Pat and Carol for coming to the new teacher. Thank we you. were rewarded with take-home yeah. yeah. dessert, <laughs> so it was worth it. You know, and I know folks, folks had things yeah. going on no, that couldn't be there. You know, Josh had just uh, finished having his, his uh, 
procedures done. So you know. Well, I was just things, joking. Things come up. I was joking about the desserts. It was really great to meet yeah. all the yeah. new staff. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were very excited. I mm -hmm. mean, every the the. Um, High school people, the Tinmouth people, yep. the Clarendon people, they were all like, this is such a great place to work, and I hope they continue to feel that way. They felt mm -hmm. really good about uh, being in this school district, and it was really great to hear. And I don't mean just like, yeah, I got a job. They were excited, okay. and it was mm -hmm. nice. That's the, the best part that, of they it. They were so excited. So, Josh yeah. and I were there last year, and I mean, it, it's just so cool. We've, we've hired some really good people the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah. We really have. Really uh, which unique. When, when it's an interesting thing because hiring is hard, so you don't have as many interviews. We've been really lucky that we've had really solid people. Yeah. We really have been. Yeah, so. that's great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, agenda building. So we're at Shrewsbury. Uh, we are going to have, you're going to be thrilled, Carol class size presentation too. So Shrewsbury presentation, class size presentation. Uh, do we have a need for anything else on that meeting? Um, included in our packet today, but not on the agenda was board communication. Yeah. That was something I just included for your awareness because we had a conversation around it last meeting. Ah. That's not anything for action, but I just told folks I'd type up what we talked about. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Any, anything else? Shrewsbury presentation and class size presentation? If things pop up, we can figure it out. Um, that makes for a reasonable meeting with if we have a couple of other um, you know, items that pop up like contracts and so that. Yeah, okay. we could certainly do if any personnel stuff comes up. Okay. Per, per usual, if we show up a few minutes early, are we able to get a tour? And Great question. I will check with Kristen and see if she wants to do a tour ahead of time or if she wants to do a tour as part of her presentation. We'll Perfect. figure that out. I'll tell all of you. And we set uh, community engagement early enough that if we maybe stopped at 650, we could, we could do that easily. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'll check with Kristen. We'll figure that out. I'll let you know. Sounds good. Thank Great. You. Do we need an executive session? there's not going to be snow two weeks from now. Yeah, I don't think so, but you know, no, it's been so can, we, can we write that down? Yeah. Brian said, <laughs> Brian said, go for it. Um, do we need an executive session? None, I'm aware of. Seeing none, um, I will adjourn. Oh, 9.01 p.m. Oh.